So I open up my YouTube this week, and I see something in my recommended, and it is a new rule from Bill Maher from Real Time, the new episode that just released. Now, I usually watch these every time they come out because I don't necessarily always agree with them, but sometimes I feel like they really do give you some insight and perspective on issues. It's basically Bill's moment where he can give a little bit of a longer commentary on a specific issue. Recently, I filmed a few commentaries about uh, my takeaways from our recent removal from Afghanistan and what the United States could possibly learn from it. And in case you don't end up watching those videos, basically my takeaway was maybe we should stop trying to do the whole nation-building thing. We don't seem to be very good at it. When I saw Bill Maher's new rule, The Lesson of Afghanistan, I wanted to see what Bill's lesson was that he took away from the aftermath of Afghanistan, and oh boy, it is not what I expected at all. We are going to do a response video. Never done one before, but here we go. And finally, new rule, blind hatred of America is just as blinkered as blind love. And we, and we Americans Point. should really get some perspective about where we live. Watching the shit go down in Afghanistan, I was reminded lately of every conversation I've ever had with an immigrant, almost all of which, if we got to really talking, mm -hmm. included the notion, oh, you people have no idea. All you do is bitch about and badmouth your own country, but if you knew mm -hmm. about the country I came from, you'd stop shitting on your own. Okay, now, <clears throat> we got we to gotta pause that there. I, I understand that that's probably an applause line that, you know, fiercely patriotic Americans are definitely going to get into, and even his audience is going to clap for that. But I want you to think about that comment for a minute. Let's just come back here for a second. Um, all the immigrants he has talked to. Now, I want you to think about that sample. The immigrants he's talked to. So we're talking specifically about people who immigrated from another country to the United States. I'm guessing most of them didn't do that because they wanted to live in a worse place, right? So your sample size is very skewed here. It's not like you went around the world and tried to determine if people are more or less happy in the countries where they are currently in. In fact, if you actually look at the World Happiness Report, you'll find out that the United States is definitely not at the top, falling at, what is it, 18th place back in 2020. If we were to go to 2019, I think you're going to find that we are 19th at that point. If we go to 2018, the United States is 18th. And there's all these other countries that are somehow happier than us. The point is, if you talk to people who came here from another country because they had a bad situation there, looking for a better situation here, they're probably going to have a negative opinion about that country and a pretty positive opinion of ours. It's like saying, well, according to all of the people in happy marriages we talk to, people in marriages are happy. Yeah, of course. Look at your sample size. I have never been a rah-rah America type, and in fact have often made fun of Republicans in the past for being overly sentimental, because they're the ones who tear up at military flyovers and get a boner when the governor of South Dakota rides into a biker rally dressed like a painting of Teddy Roosevelt. I kind of love that, though, so I guess I'm part John of the problem. Boehner, but liberals, as usual in this era, have now gone too far in the other direction. They no. under-romanticize America. They have no perspective. Who? Last week, the Taliban murdered a comedian. His name was Nazar Muhammad, and he made up funny songs on TikTok. They forced him into a car, tortured, and then executed him. A comedian. A thing like that hits a little close to home for me. Okay, so when people bring up names in these things, I have a tendency to want to look them up. Okay. So, Nazar Muhammad. Okay, I found an article, actually several articles, that will confirm this, actually. 
Uh, Al Jazeera happens to be the one that is toward the top, uh, at least the one that I didn't need to have a subscription for. And uh, it does show Taliban admits to killing Afghan comic to try alleged killers. Nazar Muhammad's body, shot multiple times, was found in Kandahar after a video showed he was abused by two gunmen in a car. Um, so, yeah, I mean, don't expect me to somehow, like, go to bat for the Taliban. I'm not going to do that. I was never going to do that. And I think that their claims that they've somehow changed or seen the light after two decades. Oh yeah, I see religious fundamentalists do that all the time. No, I, I don't I don't believe it. I don't know why we met with them. I don't know why they came to the White House. I don't know why we wanted to take them at their word. I have no idea why we thought to trust these people at all for any reason. I am not going to be in their court. No interest in doing so. I will, however, make a note, because I think it kind of speaks to the fact that the research doesn't seem to be as airtight as you would hope. He said last week. Last week, the Taliban murdered a comedian. Okay, I did not mishear that. He did say last week. This is dated August 27th, 2021. If we go back to that article from Al Jazeera, you will note that this is dated July 29th, 2021. That's a month ago, not a week ago. The reason why that's important is because it makes it sound like this was after we left the country. They started doing this. This was before that time. So I, it's important to just to clarify that. Uh, again, in no way, shape, or form am I telling you that the Taliban are somehow the good guys, but I want to get the timeline right, because it means that the United States was essentially still very present in the country when that happened. I do find this little piece kind of interesting. Uh, the men have been arrested and will be tried. Mujahid, this is the spokesman for the Taliban said he alleged that the comic from the southern part of Kandahar province was also a member of the Afghan National Police and had been implicated in the torture and killing of Taliban. Mujahid said the Taliban should have arrested the comic and brought him before a Taliban court instead of killing him. Okay, not exactly the best response that I could hope for. Uh, I thought that maybe they had done that specifically because he was a comedian I can understand why maybe they wanted to question him about the killing of people, but honestly, I kind of find it weird that their thought process is, well, this guy that was part of the National Police, we probably should have arrested him. I don't think you're learning the lesson that we're kind of worried about when it comes to you folks, okay? I'm sorry your professor said something you didn't like. That won't Here be a go. problem with the Taliban because you're not allowed to go to school. Okay. So, uh, first of all, of course, talking about oversensitive children uh, getting angry at their professors. Here we go again. Uh, but then uh, a talk about how the Taliban won't allow you to go to school. Well, won't allow women to go to school. Girls, traditionally, were not allowed to go to school. And again, although the Taliban says they're not going to do that anymore, it really wouldn't surprise me if they absolutely still do. For perspective, I just thought I would bring up an article from the Human Rights Watch. Uh, this is Afghanistan Girls Struggle for an Education, Insecurity, Government in Action, and Donor Disengagement Reversing Vital Gains. And they basically talk about how uh, there are a lot of children that are out of school, 3.5 million children are out of school, and 85% uh, of them are girls. Only 35% of adolescent girls are literate compared to 66% of adolescent boys. This does seem like a pretty big problem, and uh, traditionally the Taliban had been responsible for maintaining that sort of uh, level, actually to a much worse degree. There is one thing that's probably worth noting. This again is dated October 17th, 2017. So this was still a struggle that was going on while American occupation was in place. We didn't just solve the problem. 
it was very much still there. Now, I guess you could argue, and it would be a fair argument, that it's different. The Taliban would not let you do that, and we were just unable to figure out a system to get there. But it does feel like the end result is the same. Further on in the article while we're here, Afghanistan's government provides fewer schools for girls than boys at both the primary and secondary level. In half the country's provinces, fewer than 20% of teachers are female, major barrier for many girls whose families will not accept their being taught by a man, especially as they become adolescents. Don't know what their problem might be there. Many children live too far from a school to attend, which particularly affects girls. About 41% of schools have no buildings, and many lack boundary walls, water, and toilets, disproportionately affecting girls. I want to just, again, reiterate this. This is the government that we essentially put up there. And it's still a problem. So we didn't just come in, rah rah sis boom bah, America, and fix the problems. They were still there. In Saudi Arabia, grown women can be jailed for doing the kind of things we think of as routine without the permission of a male guardian. So why did we sell them China so many weapons? China rounds you up if you're a, the wrong religion and puts you in camps. So why do we give them favored More children nation status? children in Burkina Faso work than are in school. Why do we exploit Only Africa? Only 5% of Burundians have electricity. Same question. The homicide rate in Honduras is eight times what it is here. The inflation yeah. rate in Venezuela is 2,719%. So dictatorships are bad. in the last five years has put to death 27,000 low-level drug dealers. Same point. My old job. Ah, uh, because he used to do a lot of drugs. I, I don't understand why he keeps bringing these things. Yeah, if you bring up the worst possible scenarios around the world, yeah, America's gonna look amazing. In North Korea, people starve to death. The only people who starve here are doing it for a role. Uh, funny. Okay, uh, yeah, we don't have a problem with, uh, starvation. But, oh, don't go to places like Feeding America, you know, that organization. Because they'll tell you that actually, hunger in America is a very real thing. Starvation and food insecurity are a very big deal. There's been about 42 million people that may experience food insecurity because of the coronavirus. But, don't worry, <laughs> COVID is not the sole reason why we have that problem. Because, according to the USDA's latest household food insecurity in the United States report, more than 35 million people in the United States experienced hunger in 2019. Oh yeah, this problem that's only in North Korea. You know, I heard a story recently about a woman who came from North Korea to the United States and felt like the two countries were the same because in North Korea they tell you that America is horrible and then when she got here to America America, she found that over here we also say America is horrible. And that was her takeaway. Again, it's a really weird one, because if you did the opposite thing, you would get a very different result set. Go to North Korea and tell them that you don't like their government. You don't like the model that they go by. You've criticized the leader. Yeah, that's not going to go over well. But you do it here, that's patriotism. That's the difference. It's a big one. And yeah, we should be very happy about that, but don't start trying to make us sound like we should be more like North Korea, or that because North Korea is suffering from a lot of problems, we should just stop worrying about it. Because as I'm trying to show you here, the problems that you're complaining about, Bill, are indeed here in this country too. Maybe not to as much of a degree, maybe not as severe. But they are indeed here, and they are worth addressing, and people aren't being woke, or social justice warriors, or engaging in cancel culture because of it. Also, side note, the second he starts talking about those terms, I kind of tune him out, because it seems like the same old tambourine being played over and over again. It's quick shorthand for oversensitive people. And it makes it seem like every time they have any complaint, whether it's legitimate or not, they are just 
bitching about stuff. And the only people who have no water live in California. <laughs> Doesn't that kind of show you? California's in America, Bill. Think California's in America. You live there. If you're having a problem with water, doesn't that show you that it's still... Oh, boy. Okay, just keep going. America is irredeemable. Turn on the news. Or Who get says a passport it's irredeemable? A There's a reason Afghan mothers are handing their babies to us. After we made a power yes. vacuum in the country and left them and there. Should take them. Americans right now should take in Afghan he refugees is right about into that. their homes and into their neighborhoods. Yes. We made the problem. We need to clean it up. I agree with him on that. And I'm sure everyone who just clapped is thinking the same thing. Yes, someone who isn't me should definitely do that. Not in my backyard. Very American. Yeah. It's true. But that doesn't true. make us the bad guys. We're not the bad guys. Oppression is what we were trying to stop in Afghanistan. Okay. I mean, that's what we said. And technically... Like, that's what we achieved. But it didn't last. See, I think that this is the problem with this piece. When he says this is the lesson of Afghanistan, it doesn't feel like he's learned any lessons. It doesn't feel like we're learning any lessons. Yeah, okay, we went in with the idea that we were going to liberate the country from oppression. But, but we didn't... <laughs> We didn't succeed. And in a minute, he's even going to say that we didn't succeed. And shouldn't that be the takeaway? That we should learn to do a better job of it after 20 years? As the most powerful nation on earth? We went in there. And after that period of time, we couldn't build the infrastructure so that they could stand on their own two feet when we left? We couldn't do that? We've just put them back in another position of oppression. We failed, but any immigrant will tell you we've largely succeeded here, and yet the overriding thrust of current woke ideology is that America is Getting rotten to the core, irredeemably racist from the moment it was founded, and so oppressive, sexist, and homophobic. Here we go. We can't find a host for the Oscars or Jeopardy. <laughs> oh, no, not Jeopardy. All right, again, I just mentioned this, but whenever he starts getting on to the whole woke thing, it's like, oh boy, here we go again. Um, that we're irredeemable. I, I don't know who's saying that. I think that this comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of why people are trying to bring these subjects up. There's this notion, and I think that it's very heavy on the right, but I'm getting the feeling that even the left are starting to feel this, that... The reason people are complaining about racism and the historical roots of it or sexism or anything like that is to show that uh, America's terrible and we, we, don't, we don't need it. It's bad. Mer, and not what it should be taken as, which is a lot of people, yeah, usually younger, trying to say, we want the country to do better than that. We want to acknowledge what the past was. We want to see our portrait, warts and all. And we want to address that. The vast majority of people are saying that. When they talk about historical racism, when they talk about historical sexism, when they're talking about historical oppression that we did in this country, it's not to say America bad, it's to say America could be so much better. But first you have to acknowledge the mistakes you made. To me, that is not coming from a place of hatred. That's coming from a place of love. People who love, love this country, truly love this country, want it to do the best it possibly can. People who truly love this country want to see it be the best version it possibly can. People who like the pomp and circumstance of this nation, they're the ones that say you shouldn't complain. For me, that's the difference between nationalism and patriotism. Patriotism is for people who believe in the actual idealism of a country. 
they want it to be the best version that it possibly can. And it doesn't matter about the symbology of it. Nationalism, however, is essentially patriotism theater. You don't care about what the country stands for, or what it could be, or what its ideals are. You care about flags, and anthems, and ceremonies. You just want to wrap yourselves up in symbols of America. Patriotism usually means you're going to be complaining heavily about mistakes your country made. And this is where your new Afghani roommates that you took in will, will, <laughs> will prove so valuable because they'll turn to you and say, have you people lost your fucking minds? If they're just coming out of the situation in Afghanistan, that is probably the way they're going to feel. Give them a couple generations. Don't worry, they'll get it. Have you ever heard of honor killings? Public beheadings, throwing gay men off of roofs, arranged marriages to minors, state-sanctioned wife-beating, female genital mutilation, marriage by capture? Because we have. Um, I don't quite know what he means by we have. Is that saying that he's familiar with that happening in other countries? And it's so great that we don't have to worry about that here? Or is it that, yeah, because we know it happens in the United States. I'm going to guess it's the former and not the latter. But let's just go back for a minute and just look at that one more time. Because, uh, yeah, we, we got to get into some stuff. Have you ever heard of honor killings? It won't take you too long if you're researching it to find information about honor killings in the United States. Uh, this article from 2015 in The Atlantic, for instance, uh, where we have it start out talking about Eric Schmidt, the executive chairman of Google, saying, I don't see how anyone who believes in the rule of law and the rights of women could do anything other than support efforts to end female genital mutilation, forced marriage, and honor killings practices that have no place in the 21st century. And then basically a paragraph where they're talking about what most Americans don't get is that such horrors happen here in the United States of America and not just in faraway countries like Afghanistan or Somalia. This is actually some cases that they're talking about, but don't worry, I don't have to just go to the Atlantic. I, I literally just had to look up honor killings in the U.S. That's it. There's a whole Wikipedia article that, that outlines it and talks about how like, as of 2012, there was no central agency that even collected data on it, uh, but that there was a, a Houston death penalty trial that actually brought focus on it. It's not too hard to find information that says that this indeed does even happen here. Public beheadings, throwing gay men off of roofs. Okay, I can't necessarily say that public beheadings is a big thing here. I think that there might have been some lynch mobs once. Uh... So there's that. Throwing gay men off of roofs, yeah, probably doesn't happen all that much, but if you're saying violence against gay people, well, that's definitely a big problem. In fact, violence against uh, the gay community has been very prevalent in our society. You might remember just a few years ago about the Pulse nightclub. That was people getting shot. Yeah, it's nowhere near as, I guess, dramatic as people getting thrown off the roof. But it gets you to the same place. Arranged marriages to minors. Yeah, this is probably the place where he really started to lose me. Because I thought to myself, wait a second. I think that happens here. In fact, if I just look up child marriage in the United States, I get a whole bunch of data, and this happens to be the Wikipedia page, but we're going to go with it. Um, this is just weird. I, I love this. Just look at the highlighted part here. As of July 2021, six states have banned underage marriages with no exception. As of July 2021, that's recent. This includes New Jersey and Delaware in 2018. 
Pennsylvania and Minnesota in 2020, Rhode Island and New York just got on this bandwagon this year. This is... This this is it. Like 2018 is the earliest examples we can get. I remember hearing about this. I think it was like on the Philip DeFranco show, like a year or so ago, and thinking to myself, "Wait a second, this happens here? Oh yeah, oh like so much." Between 2000 and 2015, over 200,000 minors were legally married in the United States, or roughly six children per thousand. Vast majority of them were between a minor girl and an adult man, and in many cases, minors in the U.S. may be married when they are under the age of sexual consent, which varies from 16 to 18 depending on the state. In some states, minors cannot legally divorce or leave their spouse, and domestic violence shelters typically do not accept minors. I don't know why he's acting like these things don't happen here. Now, I'm sure when you think about child marriages, though, it's probably younger than what it is here. Uh, 67% of the children were 17, then 16, 15, less than 1% or 14. And there are indeed some cases of 13 and 12 year olds getting married here in this country. Uh, there includes some extreme examples, like in 2010 in Idaho, where a 65-year-old man married a 17-year-old girl, and in Alabama, where a 74-year-old man married a 14-year-old girl. According to Unchained at Last, as you can see up here, they are listed as a the only non-profit advocacy group dedicated to ending child marriage in the United States. I bet you didn't know that that existed. The youngest girls to marry in 2000 to 2010 were three Tennessee 10-year-old girls who married men aged 24, 25, and 31, respectively, in 2001, with the youngest boy to marry being an 11-year-old who married a 27-year-old woman in Tennessee in 2006. I want to also make it very clear, these are completely legal marriages in the United States, which also means that sexual consent is not necessarily given by their age, but by marriage. This happens in the United States, and it's only as of, like, 2018 that any states have started to address it. State-sanctioned wife-beating, female genital mutilation. Okay, I don't know if it's necessarily state-sanctioned wife-beating. I guess that isn't really here, but... It's not like we do a really good job in this country of, I don't know, protecting women against domestic violence or even men against domestic violence. Like, you know how many shelters there are? You know how many rape kits there are in police departments all across the country? How we don't seem to take it seriously and the problem just exacerbates over the course of time? I don't even have numbers for that. I just know that it happens quite a bit, and frankly, I don't really even want to research it. But the genital mutilation thing, that's always an interesting one, isn't it? Because it really perks the ears up. It also will not take you very long to find information about how it absolutely happens in the United States. Take the AHA Foundation. Uh, all I had to do was do a quick search about, and this is going to make my Google history look incredibly odd, uh, female genital mutilation in the United States. And you can find that this is a case that was dealt with by legislators in Kentucky that passed a comprehensive ban against female genital mutilation uh, because this did indeed happen. And so it was passed with unanimous support. That's terrific. I will also mention, though, because they mentioned COVID-19, this was real recent Real recent. So this is not like in the long, long ago, the way, way back. And I will say that when you go down to the comments section here, you will also hear a lot of people go, cool. Now, what about all of those years of male genital mutilation, which they're usually talking about circumcision? That's still very much happening in the country to a whole lot of boys. And that's perfectly fine. So, yeah. Marriage by capture? 
Okay, so I can't necessarily tell you that marriage by capture happens in the United States. At least I certainly hope it doesn't. I can't really show you a whole lot of articles about it, so I'm going to assume that maybe maybe he's right about that. But you know what I do hear? Like, the first thing I thought of when I heard that was, oh, maybe he's talking about human trafficking. And I got bad news for you. That very much does happen in the United States. Uh, there's a whole profile that they made for it. Uh, forms of human trafficking, like debt bondage, domestic servitude, forced child labor, uh, sex trafficking, like I was saying. And this is a very unreliable source, by the way. This is, this is just the U.S. State Department. Don't worry about it. Further, you can go to the ACLU and find an article where they make a statement about the U.S. Department of State estimating 14,500 to 17,500 people being trafficked into the United States each year. So that is still a problem that we're dealing with. What's the lesson of Afghanistan? Maybe it's that everyone from the giant dorm room bitch session that is the internet should take a good look at what real oppression looks like. America may not be the country of your faculty lounge and Twitter dreams, but no one here tries to escape by hanging on to an airplane. Because we created a power no, vacuum. We wait till we're inside the plane to fight. <laughs> and then only because they cut off the beverage service. Yeah, no, there are assholes. So I'm going to grant you that. Um, so that's that's how we end this piece. And uh, big, big applause. Great. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, they're hanging on to the side of the plane because of the horrible mismanagement that we had in Afghanistan. The problem here is that what he's talking about is that, well, it's not going to be a perfect nation. And it's like, yeah, no, it's not. And I think we all accept that it's not. And there are some people who probably would never be satisfied. And those people are always going to exist in your society, no matter where your society is. Uh, but the vast majority of people just want the country to do better than it did before. When you see those scenes from Afghanistan, I don't have the takeaway that warm, fuzzy feeling about the United States being so great. I ask myself a question about if the United States is so great and we had engaged in trying to build up a country for 20 years being as great as we are, then we should be able to leave that country smelling like a rose. And we very much didn't. And it seems like all of the problems that we have here, we take with us when we try to build other countries. The lesson of Afghanistan, as I said at the beginning, should have just been, maybe don't try to do the nation building. We're not good at it. I understand that if he thinks that there's all of these people out there that are so hypercritical of the United States... Uh, that maybe they're not going to get everything they want. But what Bill, and I think a lot of conservatives, don't seem to understand is that the reason why the country is anywhere near as good as it is has been because of people just like that never accepting that the country is good enough yet. People having unrealistic expectations of what their country can be here is the reason the country is anywhere near good enough now. If we had stopped complaining and just been grateful, like generation after generation has told the revolutionary groups coming up throughout this country's history, if we had just sat down, shut up, and looked pretty, put a smile on our face and stopped complaining, no, the country would not look like this today. Not at all. The only reason it is halfway decent to live in is because of the people who said, no, I refuse to accept that the country is as good as it can be. I refuse to believe that. And now, what? You want people to stop complaining or stop fighting as hard? You're not going to get the perfect country. Yeah, but if you stop thinking about how you might get the perfect country, you're not even going to get halfway there. You got to dream big to get some semblance of a good reality.
And then we get to the comment section. Oh, don't we love the comment section? I'm not going to inflict that upon you here, but I did notice something, that we had a lot of comments, and they were mostly from Republicans and conservatives talking about how more and more they seemed to be agreeing with Bill Maher's position. And some people took, again, the wrong lesson away from this. The lesson they took away from it was that, obviously, this shows if there's a liberal like Bill Maher out there who seems to be heading back towards center, it shows how loopy the left has gotten. Yeah. Uh, no. Because in most countries, Bill Maher would be considered conservative. Or at least center-right. How do I know that? Well, let's talk a little bit about the political compass. For those of you who are not aware, the political compass is actually something apparently you can even take a test on, where they will ask you questions about your positions on issues, and you can get mapped onto this lovely graph that essentially talks to you about your political leanings. And this goes everywhere from authoritarianism at the top to libertarianism at the bottom, and economic left and right. Now, you could actually see that, as I have occasionally seen that, as essentially socialism and capitalism. If you want to use those terminologies, it's very similar. And uh, this looks like a pretty good graph. And at first blush, you might think to yourself, oh, well, obviously, our people are all scattered around that graph, right? And that's why Mar is coming back towards center. And, and why we we got to pull all these radical liberals back from this area over here, way on the socialist side here. Um, but uh, when they actually mapped all of the 2020 presidential candidates onto that map, you get a pretty different view. Let me show you. This is... Um, this is how our political spectrum actually looks, in case people are not aware. So, up here in the authoritarian capitalists, essentially, you have, you have the Republicans, right? You have the Republicans. You have, you have O'Rourke, Pence, you got Trump, right? Uh, way, way the hell up here. Um, but then, funny enough, you have the Democrats, too. A little lower down on the authoritarian capitalist scale, but very much still in this block. Okay, who are our outliers? Let's look at them, huh? We've got we've got Gravel. Oh, remember that guy that threw the rock into the water, the ripples in the water that started the Gravel Institute? Yeah, people thought he was a, a, a loopy dupe. Well, look, he's pretty much just on the other side of authoritarianism in the libertarian category. Uh, Williamson, remember her? Yeah, she's 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 actually, she was running as a Democrat, and she's still on the right here. Uh, okay, Sanders, remember how Sanders? Oh, he's a he's a far right socialist, and he's actually he's actually just like a little bit over the line from capitalism to to the socialist side. So that's that's how uh, horribly socialist he is. And now when they talk about the radical left talking about uh, socialist programs, oh yeah, look look at them. Like Warren here on the capitalist side and and oh god, Biden. Ah, Biden's such a such an absolute uh socialist. He's he's halfway down the line here on the uh on the capitalist side and still in the authoritarian camp. Um, like, they're all here. <laughs> this is our political spectrum, folks. There's like no one in this sea of political thought in the United States. So when people say that Marr is, is getting back to normal, what they're saying is that he was here-ish and he's moved here-ish. Or actually, more likely, he was here-ish already, and he's moving right around here-ish. So the TLDR of this video that has now gone on far too long is that while Marr may be right about a few things, like the idea that the country is not irredeemable, and people who think that are wrong, 
I also don't really know if there's all that many like he might think. And if he's telling me that these problems that he's mentioned that are horrible in other nations just don't happen here and isn't that great, he's overlooking the fact that, maybe to a lesser degree and lesser severity, it does. And we haven't even gotten into the problems that we have here that they don't seem to have in other countries. Like healthcare. Like our environmental controls. Like economic disparity. Those we aren't doing well at. And other countries have been. You can talk about all the immigrants that are coming into the country. But there's also some expats that leave. I know a few of them. I've talked to them. They're in other countries. And a lot of them are pretty happy there. I love this country. I do. But my version of love means that sometimes you have to get tough on it. And you have to tell it that it did a bad thing. It did the, it did the countrying bad. Not only do I think it is your right to criticize the government, its leadership, its policies, its history. I feel like it is your duty as an American. Your duty to criticize it. It's necessary. We are the most powerful nation on earth. We are the most affluent nation on earth. But we didn't get there by sitting back, putting a smile on our face and saying, there's no reason to complain, everybody. There's nothing better that we can do. No, it was by people who were willing to stand up, who were willing to maybe have an unpopular opinion because they thought it was good for the country, who were willing to risk a whole lot of downvotes on a video on a channel he doesn't get much traction on anyway from a lot of angry fans. I can't imagine that would happen here. And look, we're in completely different leagues. Uh, Mar has an audience of millions. I have an audience of Doug. And that's sort of why I'm worried, because he's usually considered to be the liberal talking piece. And when you look at that graph again, you realize that liberal in our nation is basically center-right. When people talk about Biden like he's the most progressive president that we've ever had, and then you look at his political leanings and realize, oh, right, he's still an authoritarian capitalist and still basically middle right in terms of the overall political spectrum, you realize we still have a lot of problems going on. And while I do love the country, and I love the fact that I am from this country, it's because of all of that I wanted to do better. And I am constantly reminded in the back of my head that the reason why this place is seemingly Shangri-La came at great expense, not just from Americans, but from all the countries we left in the dirt. So many of those places that he talks about, the terrible things that happened there, there's usually a 50-50 chance that part of that was because of U.S. intervention. Sometimes we wanted cheap or free labor. Sometimes we wanted mineral or oil resources. And we would go into countries and we would utilize it, no matter if the people there wanted us to or not. And usually to the detriment of those nations. We installed dictators all over the world, and it ended up not working too well, and leaving the people in those places in terrible conditions. This is who we are. And there's a lot of people who would like to eventually acknowledge that that's who we have been and say we don't want to be that anymore. That's not a weakness. And that's not just people complaining. Those are legitimate concerns. I don't really know how to end this video. All I really want to leave you with is a basic idea, a thought. That if you're a nation that talks about how great you are, 
and want to export that greatness to other countries around the world, then you would certainly hope that when you get there, you can make that happen. Afghanistan should teach us the lesson that we don't. That if we really were so amazing, yeah, we would have been able to set them up way better. And if we never had any intention of setting them up that well, then we shouldn't have gone there in the first place. And we should have known that there wasn't a reason. And if we still went in knowing full well that we couldn't build that country, then we went there for ulterior reasons. None of these scenarios are good. Don't get so high and mighty thinking that this country is just above it all. That it's just a paradise. When we had the BLM rallies last year to protest police brutality, it wasn't even the outpouring of support I saw in this country that really stuck with me. It was the outpouring from other nations that also held rallies in support of BLM. And it makes you wonder if they can take that much time away from their problems to think about the problems we have in the United States, how much of a paradise are we? And more importantly, how much road do we have left to travel? If you love your country, you have to be tough on it. You can't just hand wave away the bad stuff. You have to see it for what it is. You have to address it. You may have heard the phrase, those who do not understand the past are doomed to repeat it. Well, in many ways, the things that Mara is complaining about in this video are people trying to address those problems and him not liking it. Until you do, we are doomed to repeat it over and over again. And there's going to be a point where you can't just put on a happy face. You have to keep addressing it until it's gone until you solve the problem. And right now, I don't think America wants to. And in many ways, that's the saddest thing of all.